Hey guys, welcome back to Mr. Donnell's Social 9 podcast. This is chapter 3, episode 3. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at a a few different cases that has happened in Canada over the past having to do with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and how they were used in uh, in the Supreme Court to fight for people's rights. To start off this episode, we're going to look at just a little fun fact. Shopping on Sundays versus the Sabbath. So in your lifetime, you have probably always been able to shop on a Sunday, including in my lifetime. Did you know that until 1985, there was a law called the Lord's Day Act that made it illegal for most Canadian businesses to open on a Sunday? The law upheld the Christian Sabbath or the day of rest. You can think here, how some people might take exception to that, especially if they're not Catholic. So, Charter of Rights and Freedoms comes out three months after the Charter. The Supreme Court overturned the law, finding that it violated Canada's fundamental right, the freedom to choose your own religion. So you can see, a lot of times, as soon as this Charter of Rights and Freedoms came out, it's being used in the Supreme Court of Law to fight for people's rights. So, the assignment that goes with this episode... Um, is right here, uh, using pages 105 to 109, and I'm gonna I'll read read this with you guys because some of these stories are pretty interesting and how the charter was used to protect these people. So in the left column there, you got what right was being violated. So which one of their rights or freedoms in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was being violated? Um, what action was taken? What, what did they do? And then what was the end result uh, of their actions? So I'm starting right now with the first story. Um, on page 105, and I'll read with you guys here. The first one is called Breaking the Communication Barrier. Imagine you're in a hospital, and none of the doctors or nurses speak your language. For BC's Robin Eldridge and John and Linda Warren, the scenario was a terrifying reality. All three of them have been born deaf. Until 1990, Whenever they needed to see a doctor, a non-profit agency in Vancouver provided sign language interpreters free of charge. When the agency became short of funds, however, the service disappeared. When Robin Eldridge next went to the hospital, she discovered that the province wouldn't provide an interpreter to help her understand the doctor's advice. When Linda Warren gave birth to twins, she watched helplessly as her babies were whisked from the room for treatment. She found herself unable to ask where they had been taken or why. Warren and her husband, along with Robin Eldridge, took the B.C. provincial government to court. They argued that people who relied on sign language needed interpreters to communicate properly with health care workers. By failing to provide interpreters, they said the B.C. government was violating their equality rights under the Charter. The trio fought their case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and won. Story 2. Always open, 24-7. Have you ever spent a Sunday afternoon shopping? For many of your parents, that simply wasn't an option. Until 1985, the Lord's Day Day Act made it illegal for most Canadian businesses to open on a Sunday. Again, the law upheld the Christian Sabbath, or Day of Rest. In May 1982, three months after the Charter and Rights and Freedoms became part of Canada's Constitution, so it didn't take long for people to realize what they could do with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in court. Calgary's Big M Drug Mart deliberately opened for business on a Sunday to challenge the Lord's Day Act. It deliberately broke the law to make a point. When the challenge came before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court overturned the law. It found that the Lord's Day Act violated Canadians' fundamental right to freedom to choose your own religion. You can look at the questions at the bottom of page uh, 106 there just to get some more thoughts on um, how you feel like how, how the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was used effectively in this case. Next story that we've gone over um, a little bit in the past was restrictions on flying. So here we're talking about uh, Canada's no-fly list. 
In June 2007, Canada's government banned certain people from traveling by air for security reasons. We've got two articles here from the Toronto Star. A Canadian no-fly list of people to be barred, banned, from boarding airline flights is set to take effect on June 18, 2007. The move amounts to a black list of people reasonably suspected, keyword there, by federal officials as immediate threats to the safety of aircraft, passengers, or crew. Under the rules, as passengers check in for flights, their names will be automatically screened against the government's no-fly list. The new rules will apply to all passengers who appear to be 12 years of age or older. Who's on this list? People deemed threats to airline safety, including members of terrorist groups and individuals convicted of one or more serious and life-threatening crimes against aviation security. So again, I want you to Try to put your bias out here, including myself, when you think about these no-fly lists and how the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is supposed to protect these people, whether you agree with it or not. Second article there was calls to suspend the no-fly list. So these are people that are arguing that there should not be a no-fly list. Canada's Privacy Commissioner, Jennifer Stoddart, says the government should suspend Canada's new no-fly list. The Privacy Commissioner watches out for the privacy of Canadians, as required under the Canadians' Privacy Act. Stoddard says the no-fly list makes secretive use of personal information and profoundly impacts the rights of Canadians, including freedom of association with any groups and mobility rights. Lindsay Scotton studies issues for the Privacy Commissioner. She says airline safety is important, but so are your rights. The no-fly list suspends people's rights based on suspicion alone. What about the rights of innocent until proven guilty? In Scotton's view, it's difficult to know where the balance lies. This is probably the one of the most difficult scenarios that we'll be talking about. And we'll have a class discussion as well on this. Next one. And you also have an interesting political cartoon on page 108. And uh, I'll bring this up in the class discussion, our next class discussion, to see if anyone can uh, get that one correct. The last one, banning junk food ads uh, for kids. So we got advertising attempts to persuade people of all ages to buy products. How might the Charter of Rights and Freedoms affect decisions about advertising to children? As you read this page, consider how the Charter could affect other decisions for children, such as standards for toys, games, and TV programs. Here you think about uh, when you see ratings on video games, age ratings on movies, TV shows, um, etc., even on toys. The article here is from 2006. Experts, experts suggest marketing food to children is a powerful and dangerous tool. They say there's an important link between advertising junk food to youth and unhealthy eating habits. Children have their own spending money and they influence family purchases. Two reasons marketers are interested in advertising to children who... Um, this is two reasons why marketers are big time interested in advertising to children. Greatly affect the buying power of families. But advertising to children has also caught the interest of lawmakers because children are at risk, he added. Until the age of nine, it's been studied, children can't tell the difference between a commercial and regular programming. So the question there is, is there anything in the charter that the government could use or that people could use to stop um, advertising, banning junk food ads to kids. And we'll can discuss that uh, as well. That is it for Chapter 3, Episode 3. See you guys next time. Thanks a lot.